Welcome to Westminster Abbey on the eve of Commonwealth Day. Now, each year, traditionally, a vibrant service is held, attended by the Queen, but this year is slightly different. The Dean has very kindly allowed us to invite some of the brightest and most talented performers in the UK into the Abbey to celebrate the Commonwealth. We're also honoured to have contributions from the Royal Family. Her Majesty the Queen will share her Commonwealth Day message and the Prince of Wales, the Duchess of Cornwall, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge and the Countess of Wessex will join us in marking this very special occasion. Now, although they can't be here in person, we'll also be hearing from inspiring Commonwealth voices from across the globe as we celebrate the Commonwealth in 2021. Thank you, Dean of Westminster, for welcoming us to your Abbey. Um, it's wonderful to be in this magnificent building. Tell us about Commonwealth Day and its connection to this place. Uh, we've been doing this for a long time. It's been annual since 1972. It's a great occasion for us, and we really enjoy the relationship with the Royal Commonwealth Society. All, all the Commonwealth countries have national days, and on their national days, the High Commissioner and very often members of the High Commission come to the Abbey and will say prayers for them. So I've been here just over a year now, and when we were allowed, I was getting into the rhythm of meeting these people for whom the Abbey and the Commonwealth and that association was really important. We're, we're steeped in it here, and we've kept those prayers going uh, throughout this last year. At the moment, there's no international travel. People are feeling very isolated around the country. Why is it so important, do you think, to reach out and celebrate our global community? Well, one of the things the Commonwealth does is to remind us that actually distance doesn't stop friendship and commitment and of course we need to obey the rules at the moment but we also need to remember that our future is to be together uh, living together in peace and friendship and this service is a great reminder of what people can achieve together and what is her majesty the queen's role in the commonwealth she's the head of the commonwealth uh, and that's clearly critical but that doesn't quite tell you just uh, just what her significance is uh, over, over many long years, it's Her Majesty the Queen uh, who's told us what the Commonwealth is all about, uh, that it's about loyalty and friendship and a commitment uh, to peace and to freedom. She, she is the person who over and over again has put it into words. Uh, she also lives the Commonwealth. At her coronation, her dress was covered in the flowers of the Commonwealth. For her, uh, it is a way of life. And being by this coronation chair, uh, we, we just get reminded of the promises she made. That's an oath, and she's taken it seriously. Well, thank you once again for inviting us in. Thank you. the coming week, as we celebrate the friendship, spirit of unity, and achievements of the Commonwealth, we have an opportunity to reflect on a time like no other. Whilst experiences of the last year have been different across the Commonwealth, 
stirring examples of courage, commitment, and selfless dedication to duty have been demonstrated in every Commonwealth nation and territory, notably by those working on the front line who have been delivering health care and other public services in their communities. We have also taken encouragement from remarkable advances in developing new vaccines and treatments. The testing times experienced by so many have led to a deeper appreciation of the mutual support and spiritual sustenance we enjoy by being connected to others. The need to maintain greater physical distance or to live and work largely in isolation has, for many people across the Commonwealth, been an unusual experience. In our everyday lives, we have had to become more accustomed to connecting and communicating via innovative technology, which has been new to some of us, with conversations and communal gatherings, including Commonwealth meetings, conducted online, enabling people to stay in touch with friends, family, colleagues and counterparts who they have not been able to meet in person. Increasingly, we have found ourselves able to enjoy such communication as it offers an immediacy that transcends boundaries or division, helping any sense of distance to disappear. We have all continued to appreciate the support, breadth of experiences and knowledge that working together brings. And I hope we shall maintain this renewed sense of closeness and community. Looking forward, relationships with others across the Commonwealth will remain important as we strive to deliver a common future that is sustainable and more secure, so that the nations and neighbourhoods in which we live, wherever they are located, become healthier and happier places for us all. Lord and I 
Bob Marley classics, Three Little Birds and One Love, performed by the ACM Gospel Choir and the Dole Foundation. And we're grateful to Rhys Edward for carrying the Commonwealth flag. Our next contribution comes from the Prince of Wales. On Commonwealth Day, I am reminded once again that the essence of the Commonwealth is its remarkable diversity. A family of some 2.4 billion people from 54 nations across six continents, whose traditions, knowledge, and talents offer an incomparable richness of ideas and perspectives on the world we share. When we gathered here in Westminster Abbey on Commonwealth Day last year, such a challenge was unfolding at a scale that few could have imagined. Twelve months on, the Coronavirus pandemic has affected every country of the Commonwealth, cruelly robbing countless people of their lives and livelihoods, disrupting our societies, and denying us the human connections which we so dearly cherish. Amidst such heartbreaking suffering, however, the extraordinary determination, courage, and creativity with which people have responded has been an inspiration to us all. This pandemic has shown us the true nature of a global emergency. We have learned that human health, economic health, and planetary health are fundamentally interconnected, and that pandemics, climate change, and biodiversity loss are existential threats which know no borders. Nature, it seems to me, is at the heart of this. She is central to all aspects of our existence, from the air we breathe, our nourishment and shelter, to our spiritual, cultural, and recreational well-being. Universal principles rooted in the harmony of nature's patterns, cycles, and geometry can, in fact, be harnessed to inform sustainably align science, technology, design, and engineering. Encouragingly, it is increasingly our young people who make up 60% of the Commonwealth citizens who instinctively understand how critical it is to protect and restore the natural world. The Commonwealth is on the front line of this endeavor. Over the years, having visited almost every part of the Commonwealth, I, I have seen for myself so many of the remarkable landscapes and marine environments and the precious biodiversity they hold. I have also seen how the remarkable ingenuity and talent across the Commonwealth can provide so many of the solutions, be it renewable energy in India, uh, regenerative agriculture in South Africa, green hydrogen in Australia, sustainable shipping in Barbados, reforestation in Rwanda, the marine economy in Fiji, or nature-based solutions in Canada, the Commonwealth is at the forefront of global innovation and action. For my part, I am determined to do what I can to support this vital effort, which is why I recently launched my Terra Carta to serve as the basis of a recovery plan for nature, people, and planet. The Commonwealth has been a cornerstone of my life for as long as I can remember. It is my dearest wish that it might also be the cornerstone of a sustainable future for us all. As we recover from everything that we have endured and continue to endure through this pandemic, we have an unprecedented opportunity to change course.
by harnessing the extraordinary potential of our Commonwealth family, we are uniquely placed to lead the way. So let us be the boldest of the bold, and let us offer an example to the world. I was lucky to grow up in one of the most forested regions in Kenya. And I remember planting my first tree at the age of seven and even being able to see clean streams that I could directly drink from. And I would say this connection made me develop a very strong love for nature. I got to feel angry about seeing people cutting down trees and even passing by places and finding people maybe throwing trash out of car windows. My name is Elizabeth Wathuti. I'm an environmentalist and a climate activist, and I'm working to create a livable world now and a safe future for all by inspiring the young generation. We want everyone to understand that nature is a part of us and not apart from us. Nairobi River has, of course, been polluted as a result of different challenges, and the contributors can be citizens and also bigger industries at the same time. So every person is a part of this problem. And so at one point in time, I took children to see the state of the pollution, and I remember that I could see the sadness in their eyes. I could see that they were very much devastated. And of course, two questions that these children asked me, and one of them was, who did this? And the other question they asked me was, what can we do about this? So I thought to myself, why not create a generation of young people who are environmentally conscious and who can have that chance to also connect to nature at a young age and love nature at a young age? And what happens when you love something? Are you going to destroy it? No. Are you going to interfere with it? No. If you love a tree so much, are you going to cut it down? No. I decided to begin a campaign that I dubbed Adopt a Tree Campaign, whereby I would ensure that every child in every school in my country gets a chance to plant and adopt a tree each in their school compound. It's not just about planting a tree. It's about planting a tree, watering it, nurturing it, and making sure that that tree grows up to maturity. Because just like we human beings need tenderness and we need love and we need all the care to survive, the same thing we need to put when it comes to how we address nature. Much of what I do is about changing people's mindsets and perspectives about appreciating the natural world. By working with young people in this way, I feel so much hope because the young people are courageously stepping up and standing up to shape the kind of future that they want to see. And this makes me feel hopeful about the future of this country and the future of the world. Sun. If I could sit with the sun, 
শেষ বিকেলে মতো অস্ত্র যেতাম অসীম রাতে সেই শেষ হয়নে সূর্যের সাথে আমি ঘুমিয়ে যেতাম সূর্যের সাথে আমি ঘুমিয়ে যেতাম Well, I won't be forgetting that in a hurry. Our thanks to Nithin Sawney for that beautiful performance. Now, the Duchess of Cornwall has a strong interest in reading and literacy and has launched an online reading room. She met with Claire Balding and Global Teacher Prize winner Ranjit Singh Disley from India in Poets' Corner here in Westminster Abbey. Sitting here in Poets' Corner with memorials to hundreds of wonderful writers, it seems the perfect place to discuss the importance of, of children's literacy. And it's a subject very dear to my heart as an author of children's books, and I know Your Royal Highness is something that you care about passionately. I've always had a passion for books. Uh, books have been part of my life for so long. I started reading when I was very, very young with a, with a father who was a fervent bibliophile. So from, from the age of two or three, he used to sit and read to us children, take us on wonderful adventures sort of all over the world. And I think I was bitten at that age. And from then, I've, I've just kept going. And I've got um, involved in a lot of literacy um, programs and patronages. And I, I just feel very strongly that all children should be taught to read. And getting access to books is, is crucial for that. And we're joined live on screen from India by Ranjit, who won the Global Teacher Prize for, for 2020. Ranjit, can I ask you, how have you tackled those challenges and how also have you made education fun? Because that's something you really believe in. Uh, uh, it was not an easy task for me. The girls were sitting at home, taking care of their little brothers and sisters, but no one was caring about girls' education. So I invited some girls from nearby cities, nearby villages, who were studying well, inviting them in the schools, and setting with them a role model before the parents. Now look at this girl. If they can do, it means your girl can do as well. It's now your responsibility to empower your daughter and give her her birthright of quality education. I've been doing some online reading, ma'am, with my, with my niece, who's 10. So she reads a bit of a book and I read a bit of a book. So we have the shared experience. And actually, for all that, you know, it has separated us, the, the pandemic, at least with the internet, we can be connected. And there's so much that becomes possible. Well, I, I have to admit, I have to put my hand up. So before lockdown, I wasn't a great lover of the internet. 
In fact, I, I was always trying to wrench these machines away from my grandchildren. But uh, since lockdown, I'm afraid I have, I have to admit I have become a little bit of an addict. During the first lockdown, um, I just thought it might be a good idea to, to make a list of some of my favourite books online, another asset of the internet. Um, so I launched a reading room, which is a book club, but it's, it's my reading room. It's fascinating how much it connects people all over the world. But you know. what it does as well is it creates a shared experience and I think that's what we've all been missing yeah. so much because yeah, exactly. we haven't been able to have it through yeah. sport or theatre yeah. or the usual yeah. outlet. Yeah. So actually lots of people reading the same book and then having, you know, quite an active conversation it about is. it. You could share it all, you yes. know. And I said, you've, you've, we've all been bereft of friends and a lot of people surrounding us. So it, it's nice to have a way of chatting. It is extraordinary, actually, how much more the internet has been able to, to give children and adults access to books. And, and Ranji, how has that um, impacted your students, being able to read online and being taught online? Yeah, they have experienced the power of internet as well. And reading online has actually improved them to expose themselves to new things. It also helped my students and improve their imagination. You know, there is no limit to imagination. What you can imagine, limitless. And also, it improves to reduce stress. Can I ask Ranjit one question? Um, there's a wonderful writing competition that I'm part of called the Queen's Commonwealth Essay Competition, where we get uh, uh, children from the Commonwealth to submit an essay and I think it'd be lovely if you could get your girls to join in and, and write an essay. So I'm definitely uh, doing that. Thank you so much for giving me opportunity. Well, thank you so much, Your Highness, and thank you to Ranjit. Be you far or be you near, somehow for me you're always there. I say a prayer and sing a song I always know it won't be long. Be I alone or not, I know. I never am, you're ever close. From city side to countryside, to continent to country, I take pride in knowing that I have a love, the when below lifts me above. Together we, in unity, will be again in time to be. But tied we are by lines of love. Across the world, the tides are none. To separate the thing we share, that somehow always keeps us here. I know my loved ones far and wide will soon again be by my side. Though much we learn in times of woe, I know these days are soon to go. So come what comes, oh come what may, if you're with me, I'll be okay. Although we've been apart some days, here on the line, I know you'll stay. And one day soon, I know we'll sing about the former harder things, the troubles that we've all been through, that time and strength will take us through. To days of joy, and light and mirth, where'er you be upon the earth. So when you celebrate and do, know that we are here with you. Different parts of the Commonwealth have had very different experiences of COVID-19. In New Zealand, with low levels of transmission, life has continued as normal in many parts of the nation. This has allowed the New Zealand Youth Choir to keep singing and keep sharing their music. They recorded a special Maori song of greeting for us, a call of friendship despite the distance. <laughs> No mai, haere mai, piki mai, kake mai, kiru mai, te kaupapa, te aroha, me te kotahi tangai. Pano, pano, haere mai te toki, tau mi a hui a i. Tu hakangu 
roots. so joyful. Our thanks to the New Zealand Youth Choir. Now the 8th of March not only marks Commonwealth Day, it's also International Women's Day and the Countess of Wessex was joined by author and broadcaster June Sarpong and two female activists, Virginia Kunguni from Malawi and Caitlin Figueredo from Australia. Hello uh, everybody uh, and welcome. Hi Caitlin, how are you? I'm very good, Royal Highness. Hi Virginia, how are you? It's nice to see you again. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Brilliant. Now, of course, you're both uh, part of the Queen's Young Leaders. And what would be lovely, uh, Caitlin, uh, is if you could begin to tell us some of the work that you've done. Yes. So um, I run an organisation called Jaziri Australia. So we are a youth-led organisation operating in Commonwealth countries. So we're all about trying to change the face of leadership by providing young women with opportunities to be political leaders and policy change makers. Wonderful. Now, ma'am, I know for you, gender equality is something that you're very passionate about. Why do you think it's important to have organisations like this working at the grassroots to really empower uh, the next generation of female leaders? There's no end of passion from young people um, and there's no end of desire to want to do something. But often I think they find, um, what's my next step? How do I get involved? So for Caitlin to have created an organization to put them in front of people where they can start to feel that they're having an influence is astonishing. So Virginia, can you tell us a bit about the work that you do? Yes, I run an organization called Girls Arise for Change, uh, which works to promote girls to health and education by ending social and cultural practices that undervalues women's potential here in Malawi. I actually got to visit um, Virginia's, one of J Virginia's projects when I was in Malawi. Um, so I saw firsthand what they're actually doing with these young women. Um, and I think what's really important here is that she's helping them to create uh, training and business models that actually are appropriate to where they are. We need to train more women to become financially independent. That is by not by giving them money to run businesses, but by giving them the skill. Because when we give them a skill, 
the skill is a life it's a lifetime asset for them than giving them money um often women's voices are not heard at the top and we don't have a seat at the table not in the number that we should um how do we ensure that that becomes the norm especially with everything that we see happening with covid and the fact that actually we are regressing better policy and better outcomes are achieved when women are in the room when more than half the population are in the room and getting to make sure that all of their voices all of their issues are represented brilliant i love that and and ma'am would you like to add to that uh that can become a bit of a fatigue when it comes to talking about women's rights women's issues and everything and so i'm quite keen to try and move the discussion into a place where it becomes a much more level playing field because it is a win win it's not one against the other if we now can look at education particularly in in countries where virtual education isn't as easily available um what do we do to ensure that our young girls don't get left behind through this process where i am right now in malawi the majority of schools do not have online learning because many many students do not have laptops we can't even talk about internet so as we are going back to uh, developing education uh, through this covid pandemic we really have a very big job because we've had a setback it is a real worry because there's obviously a lot of the commonwealth countries that have got we're still trying to get girls into education where are the gaps going to be there what is going to be happening to those girls right now young people in particular they have those innovation mindsets they they want to support and they want to connect i always say as women we need to learn that we are not competitors but we are supporters of each other's progress so as women we should be able to share each other's skills women should be those that are in higher positions should open up to give opportunities to those, to those women that are coming those women that are inspiring and the commonwealth is a great force for good and i think if we can keep coming together and and talking to each other and using the technology that's now at our fingertips that really has proven its worth during this last year let's use that as a force for good On that note, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, Virginia. Uh, it's been a pleasure uh, leading this conversation with you all, and continue the fantastic work. Sport plays an important role in the Commonwealth. Denise Lewis shared her experiences. I was born in West Bromwich, in the Midlands, to a Jamaican mother. Although we were immersed in an English way of life, there was always a tinge of Jamaican flavour in the house, whether it was music, cooking. or the patwa that would bellow out of my usually reserved mother's mouth when England played the West Indies cricket team. All these influences combined to give me a strong sense of my heritage and our commonwealth connection. Like many other athletes, my first experience of a major international competition was the Commonwealth Games. A games which are sometimes aptly referred to as the friendly games, but with a healthy balance of fierce competition. It's a tournament unlike any other with a strong spirit of unity permeating through every element. All of the competing countries share the bond of the Commonwealth. The national teams whose individual sports usually train apart all come together with disabled and non-disabled athletes uniting together to represent their countries. In 1994, I went into the heptathlon competition mentally unprepared to be crowned Commonwealth champion. And the games changed my life as they have done for many others before and since. I had the pride of returning to the games 4 years later as favorite, and retaining my title really was a dream come true. And like so many people around the Commonwealth, I can't wait for the games to return next year. For me, it will be like coming home to the city where my aspiration was forged, to the host city of Birmingham. This year all around the Commonwealth, the doors of gymnasiums were closed and the stadium lights were turned off. But in the face of adversity, giving up was never an option. Athletes have been demonstrating enormous resilience and resourcefulness, finding new ways to train as all our lives have been impacted. by the covid pandemic 
they have shown unwavering grit and determination to keep pushing towards their goals. I look forward to the enjoyment we will all share as our best athletes once again unite to display their exceptional talent and their years of hard work. I wish all competitors the very best of luck as we all look forward to witnessing once more the power of the Games to change lives as we celebrate the best of the Commonwealth.
simply sublime. Our thanks to Alexis French, gymnast Georgia May Fenton and Denise Lewis. And we all look forward to the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham next year. Now, the pandemic has been extremely hard for many of us, but one positive that it has shown are the networks of care that our communities are founded on. Now, many have been put under intense strain, but people across the world have adapted and worked hard to do all they can to help. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge have spoken to three inspirational voices from across the Commonwealth. Hello, my name is Dr. Zole Luas Fumba. I am a medical doctor and a frontline health worker all the way from South Africa, advocating for the healthcare workers in the world. Dr. Zola, can you hear us? Uh, hi. Yes, I can hear you. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Maybe could you give us both just a little bit of a, a brief picture of what it's like in South Africa at the moment with COVID? We're basically struggling and facing the brunt of it, I think, are the healthcare workers who are trying, you know, their best to be there and, and, and do all the work and get all the work done. But the problem is we are stressed as well. We are burnt out as well. We are burdened, you know. Um, and it's been like this for years. We have been exposed to occupational illnesses. I myself got multi-drug resistant tuberculosis as a medical student. It's been tough because of the circumstances that we've had to practice under anyway. And now the pandemic has put on a bit more, a lot more pressure. Salawa, here in the UK, there's been a massive sort of public recognition of the amazing work that the frontline are doing. And it, it's sad almost that it's taken the pandemic for the public to really back and support all those working on the front line. We actually know the problems. We see the problems every day. We walk into work, they're the problems. But the problem is our voices are not heard. We are on the front line and we are expected to lift humanity. So my advice to everybody is to, if you know a healthcare worker, any healthcare worker, you just love on them, love on them, love on them some more. <clears throat> If their child needs looking after, offer. You know, if they need a meal, offer. We, you know, Catherine and I have spoken to a lot of healthcare workers in the UK and around the world over the last year. And we hear your worries and your concerns. And, and thank you for your time chatting to us about it. Thank you, you know, for sharing for us and asking for help for us. So thank you very much. My name is Faisal Islam and I am the co-founder of Safeway, an affordable emergency medical service provider for the rural people of Bangladesh. Faisal, um, we've been hearing a little bit about your Safewheel idea. Can you tell us a little bit about it? So a couple of years ago, my best friend, uncle, had a road accident. And just because he couldn't manage an ambulance during that time, uh, he died because in our country, there are very few ambulances for rural people. So our solution is that we designed a low cost mini ambulance. So now they can get an ambulance with very affordable cost, unlike the regular ambulance. And we have plan to reach as many villages as possible and help more people. And, and how are your rickshaws kitted out? Uh, what we have is basic healthcare equipment like an oxygen cylinder and some other sorts of necessary equipment that uh, can save save the patient during that emergency situation. Faisal, very nice to meet you, and you know it's a fantastic idea, and uh, we both wish it every success in the future. Thank you very much, Your Royal Highnesses. My name is Heidi Kwagik Lee, and I'm the founding director of Refuge for the Refugees a non-profit organization that seeks to raise awareness regarding the plight of refugees in Malaysia, as well as provide education for refugee children. Maybe you could just give us a little bit of a picture as to why your organization, Refuge for the Refugees, even needs to exist. What is it that's the situation like uh, in Malaysia that, that made you want to set this up? When refugees are here in Malaysia, they don't have access to education, healthcare, job opportunities. So they're often in limbo, you know, and not everyone gets resettled. If even if they do, the waiting process is anywhere between 10 to 15 years. And these kids, if they don't get access to education of sorts, they get left behind for a very long time. And Heidi, has the recent pandemic 
made it even more challenging, not only for you to carry out the work, but also for the refugee communities. The lockdown has been difficult because the reality is for the refugee and migrant community, um, they don't have access to Wi-Fi or internet or devices that allows you know, online engagement. So I think that has been hard. And Heidi, do you know how many refugees have benefited from your programmes? I guess in total, we have reached about um, close to 200,000 refugees. Wow, yeah. that's, a, that's a sizable amount of people you've reached and it's, um, it's fantastic what you're doing. And just a huge congratulations from Catherine and I, I think, in, yeah. in terms of what you're, what you're managing and, and, and dealing with. And especially now, obviously, with the extra challenges, but really well done, you're obviously a, a vital source and a vital support to, to all those um, refugee communities out there. So keep up the hard work. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Nice to see you. Bye-bye. Take Bye -bye. care. <laughs>Thanks to Leanne Le Havers for that very special performance and to all our contributors that have been part of this unique Commonwealth celebration. We now hear from Commonwealth Secretary General Patricia Scotland. Let us pledge ourselves afresh to uphold the values of the Commonwealth, that every person possesses unique worth and dignity, that we should be good stewards of nature and of the whole earth, that there should be justice for everyone and peace between nations, that joining together as a worldwide family, we build on shared inheritances, that we cooperate with mutual respect and goodwill to deliver a common future for the good of all. And through Commonwealth Connection, we learn from one another and innovate to transform our communities, our nations and our world.
In this house of prayer, year by year, we celebrate our life as a commonwealth and as God's people. In the midst of a challenge that we all share, we ask for God's guidance and grace in looking for a better future that we can also share. It is our prayer that we might be agents of a deeper peace and a greater justice. So we ask for the gifts of an imagination that can hope abundantly and a courage to seize that hope. Confident in the richness and range of our Commonwealth today, we seek God's blessing that we might be a common people in a Commonwealth of grace. Lord God, hope of all the nations, when we feel isolated and alone, strengthen the bonds of our affection. When we face illness and death, renew our confidence in you. When fear and mistrust infect our words, renew us in the truth. And when we have great challenges before us, strengthen us. Bless, we pray, our Queen, the work of the Royal Commonwealth Society, and our shared witness that this Commonwealth of Nations may be a sign of the hope that is in us and a glimpse of the glory that you alone can give. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Forever and ever. Amen.
from the Jewish community in Canada. May the Almighty bless the Commonwealth. Sri Lanka visite Puduraj Mandaliye Samrum Dineet Tunuruangi Ashirwadi Labi Vai Apisit Patamu. God bless the Commonwealth from the Baha'i community in Zambia. Tirnduriya de Balak Sahib Sri Guru Danak Dev Sache Pacha Ji de Sarbat de Pale de Paigab on Saar Commonwealth Sare de Chali Sadguru Sache Pacha Ji Mer Paraya Hath Kirpa Badai Rakhana. God bless and protect the Commonwealth communities. We go on to the Bukhari Zolongi. May God bless all the people of the Commonwealth. God grants to the living grace to the departed rest, to the church, the queen, the commonwealth, and all people, peace and concord, and to us sinners, life everlasting. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. I remember sitting on the rocks down at the beach in my mind going over 27th of August, 27th of August and I kept saying 1979, I'll never forget this date and I don't. Every year that date comes round and we remember it. Forty years ago, Lord Mountbatten, the great uncle of Prince Charles, was blown up at sea by the IRA at Moloch Moor off the west coast of Ireland. By killing Mountbatten, you sent ripples around the world in a way which no other assassination could have achieved. No member of the British royal family had been murdered by terrorists within living memory. At the time, I could not imagine how we would come to terms with the anguish of such a deep loss. Three others were killed on the boat including two teenage boys. There was a mighty bang, a huge crack like thunder, and I immediately said, Paul is dead. The day was marked not just by the Mountbatten bomb, but by a second IRA attack that killed 18 British soldiers at Warren Point across the border in Northern Ireland. The IRA couldn't believe their luck for the nationalist population. We were monsters. This is the story of that day, told by those directly affected by it. It is hard when you see the wounds that never really got sewn up from that day and that tragedy, and, and, and that is hard. In a few minutes from now, I'll know whether or not we're going to succeed in telling the exciting story of a man whose courage and daring in the war and far-ranging influence and peace have significantly contributed to the shaping of this century's history. The man I'm after has no idea that I'm going to be I there. I remember going to the studio. No I remember the dress. I had to wear my sister's hand-me-down dress, always a hand-me-down dress. And my thanks to Lord Braeburn, John Barrett. We even had... Princess Anne's underwear, I remember one year, was handed all the way down to us. Admiral of the Fleet, the Earl Mountbatten of Burma, tonight this is your life. What do you mean? We have a whole host of surprises for you. Amazing that they managed to pull that off. Now, India, that's an unusual name, isn't it? How did you get that? 
because my grandfather was the last viceroy of India. <laughs> because my grandfather was the last viceroy of India. Of course, nowadays people say, what's a viceroy? As viceroy, he was the last colonial ruler of India. He was also admiral of the fleet, second cousin of the queen, and mentor to the Prince of Wales. The Earl Mountbatten of Burma was for half a century one of Britain's leading public figures. Can you bear having hot milk in it, or would you rather not have milk in it? In retirement, he spent more time with his family, but he still enjoyed the public spotlight so much that he allowed an ITV crew to record his annual summer holiday in Ireland, even if it meant compromising the family's privacy. Every Easter, every summer, every Christmas, every single holiday, we were together with our natural cousins. Classy born was always in the summer, a month in August. Yeah, twins, where are the twins? For all of the fact that it was called Classy born Castle, essentially it wasn't. It was a Victorian mansion with some turret built onto the end of it. Lord Mountbatten inherited Classybourne Castle from his wife, Lady Edwina, who died in 1960. There were so many wonderful traditions. The heart of the holiday was going out on the boat. I would go a lot on the boat. We all did. The building of the dams, that was absolutely a tradition and taken very seriously. Um, everybody knew what they had to do. Give it to me, I said, and you start, make the hole here. There it is, see? From here, let you start doing the dam. Out of the way, Fee. You see, he was um, admiraling, wasn't he? No, put it this way. Go on, do as you're told. Do as you're told. Let her do it. There we are. There you are. It would be hard to be chief of combined operations and then not be in charge of the family dam. Let's face it. The Mountbatten's were generally viewed by the locals as benevolent, well-meaning, helpful people who it was nice to have around. The neighborhood benefited as a result of their presence. Each summer, the Mountbatten's would take up residence at Classybourne Castle overlooking the pretty fishing village of Mullach Moor. The family's visits brought a touch of glamour and jobs for the locals. This photograph here was in the dining room of Classy Bawn at a, a dinner. That's just me there. When you look back so many years ago, it's now 40 years, you can always say the memories of of them are happy ones. And that's the most important thing of all. Do you remember this mother? Mm. Lord yeah. Louis gave you this book. Yeah. Right. Um, mm. To Mrs. Barry, with grateful appreciation, from Batten of Burma, Classybourne Castle, August 1978. And it was Barbara Carson's book of useless information. So my mother treasures that very much. I think that's the last thing he, he gave to her. The Mountbatten's were not alone in their attachment to Mullach Moor. There are my three children at Mullach Moor. That was Paul and his two sisters. Mullach Moor was a popular holiday destination for families from Northern Ireland, as well as the South. And the Maxwells from Inniskillen had their own cottage there. We went down there during summer holidays for two months every year. and. The children enjoyed it immensely. I particularly like this, this one with Paul. That summer, 15-year-old Paul Maxwell landed his dream job looking after Lord Mountbatten's boat, Shadow Five. I think they had a nice relationship. Paul would sometimes stay on the boat afterwards with Mountbatten and they would talk and he told Paul about going into the Navy. And he said, you know, I went into the Navy when I was 12 years old. 
and I saw active service when I was 16. And Paul said to him, were you not frightened, my Lord? And he said, yes, but you didn't show it. And you can see Classy Vaughan in the background there, in the distance. Classy Vaughan itself had been a fairly early example of what you might call sort of English colonization. Uh, in a sense, that quite clearly, they were intruders. The Irish obviously resented Britain as such and wanted us out. The Mountbatten summer retreat was in County Sligo, in the Republic of Ireland. Mullach Moor was only 13 miles from the border with Northern Ireland, where in 1969, a bloody conflict broke out. Catholics in Northern Ireland resented being treated as what they saw as second-class citizens, and the IRA took up arms against the British state. Despite the nearby troubles, the Mountbatten's kept coming to Classyborn. They enjoyed protection from the local police, the Garda, but it was all kept very low-key. The families themselves were very rally targeted at all, and there was very little personal animosity. But I don't believe the Garda, more than anybody else, believed that actually there was a serious threat. Judging the appropriate level of security for the Mountbatten's was a tough call. My grandfather was very keen not to have the intrusion of an overly protective force around. Which is funny when you think that on, on the mountainside there was a big painted sign, Brits, go home. Um, you arrive for your summer holiday and that's the welcome. A reminder that while the fishing village of Mullach Moor itself may have welcomed the Mountbatten's, County Sligo had deep roots in the Republican movement. Mountbatten would have been seen by people in the IRA leadership as a cultural icon of, of, of the British establishment. Anthony McIntyre joined the IRA in Belfast in 1973. He wanted to get the Brits out and create a united Ireland. Although he later fell out with the IRA, he understood their mindset at the time. He would have been targeted and his targeted and justified on the grounds that by taking him out, there was a, a blow been administered to the very heart of, of, of the British establishment. It turns out that throughout the 1970s, Lord Mountbatten had been a potential target for the IRA. Kieran Conway had risen through the IRA's ranks to become its director of intelligence by 1975. He reveals for the first time that an attempt on Mountbatten's life had been actively considered four years before the successful assassination. In the mid-70s, there was an operation cleared to uh, kill Mountbatten. He was to be ambushed either exiting or entering his castle. Four or five men, a, a, a spotter car uh, somewhere distant, then a walkie-talkie communication between the people with the guns in the car uh, to say he's on his way. You'd know roughly how long it was going to take, and, uh, uh, and then um, open up the car. The mindset in 74, 75, the early 70s would have been uh, operational, you know, like kill them <laughs> without too much reflection. I think he would have been astonished if told that there were IRA members in Ireland who were interested in his existence, let alone wanted to murder him. The 1975 plot did not get the go-ahead from the IRA's Army Council, and Kieran Conway temporarily left the IRA later that year. But the military campaign against the British security forces did not let up. 
In Crossbow Glen, it takes all the professional skills of the army to make it safe enough for the Royal Alstercombe Stabidary to walk around the town where they're charged with maintaining law and order. Two of them have been gunned down here. By 1979, the British Army had been in Northern Ireland for 10 years. Around 30,000 troops were lined up against an estimated 500 IRA volunteers. Yet 324 soldiers had already been killed. And things were particularly dangerous in South Armagh, which runs along the Irish border. Bombings and shootings. South Omar had a fairly notorious reputation as being dangerous, more dangerous perhaps than any other battalion area. Of course, South Omar adjoins the Republic, so life on the border was um, uh, challenging. South Omar Brigade was uh, beyond belief. Just its ability, their operational efficiency, they were um, visibly beating the British. In the summer of 1979, the South Armagh Brigade was plotting two of the most ambitious attacks of the IRA's campaign so far. One in Warren Point, the other just south of the border in Mullach Moor. There, during the night of the 26th of August, the IRA planted a remote-controlled 50-pound bomb on Lord Mountbatten's boat, Shadow 5, sitting unguarded in the harbour. duty at 6 a.m. up at the castle here. 9 to 9.30, Lord Mountbatten and his family came out from the castle and informed us that they were going down to the pier. So we got into a patrol car and we escorted them. In this unique photograph taken just 24 hours earlier, showing the family and staff outside Classibone. All the members of Lord Mountbatten's boat party are present. His son-in-law, Lord Brayburn, and his daughter, Patricia. Their 14-year-old twin sons, Timothy and Nicholas Natchbull, and their 83-year-old grandmother, Doreen, the Lady Dowager. The only non-family member on board was the 15-year-old Northern Irish boat boy, Paul Maxwell. The day itself comes to me in flashes, rather like small explosions. I remember distinctly sitting in the library with my brother. My grandfather and the others had gone out of the boat, and Ash and I were watching on this crackly, fuzzy television screen, Lauren Hardy. On that day, the 27th of August, 1979, I was sitting on the back patio with Paul's father and Aunt Lisa. Paul said, goodbye, Mum, see you in the evening. I didn't think that was the last time I would ever see him alive. Beautiful morning it was, sun was shining. They left Mullockmore Pier and Travelled out to where they had some lobster pots. This is where we were. Yes, looking out, you could see the boat as it came along. Dennis Devlin was a 15-year-old whose family came to Mullach Moor every summer. Their caravan was parked just off the coastal road. 
Nasinus both in a recognized for There's a green with a white cab and I just recognized it was his boat. As they come in, I could hear them talking, talking among themselves. As the boat pulled up, I remember the young fella over the side of the boat pulling in the lobster pot and slowly pulled it in. The boat had turned round towards me and I was just watching it and I knew it was Lord McBotton's boat. The next thing, everything was screwing up under the air. Everything just goes up and the news was exploding. Suddenly there was a flash of light and a loud bang. And you could see the boat had just disintegrated. It was obvious that a bomb had gone off. There was a mighty bang, a huge crack like thunder. And I immediately said, Paul is dead. And I knew he was dead because I felt a part of me go. My brother, sister and I were taken into the study and before anything we were asked to take these pills with a glass of water. I'd never taken a pill in my life before. And that to me was more surprising than anything of that day. I couldn't understand why I was being made to take a pill. Again, I think it's so reflective of the era that they were in, in the 1970s, that you would, someone would have had Valium on them, for God's sakes, and said, let's give it to the children. I mean, dear God, would you give an 11-year-old a Valium? I, for some reason, left the castle and ran down to the beach, which wasn't helpful at all, um, and incredibly inconsiderate of me now, I look back. I remember sitting down the rocks down at the beach, in my mind going over 27th of August, 27th of August, and I kept saying 1979, I'll never forget this date. And I don't, I don't. Every year that date comes around and, and we remember it. Um, and, um, and, uh, and, and it was just such an incredibly beautiful day. And on the rocks, this incredible view. Um, and yet, you know, destruction. I'm so sorry, I don't, I don't normally get upset. <laughs> I remember it very vividly, every, every moment of it really, from the very start to the very end of the day, and I think I'll always remember it. Lord Mountbatten's boat had exploded, so immediately I got two friends and we went out on the boat to see what we could do. And um, we arrived there, and those other boats that were in the near vicinity, they were already lifting the survivors. And at what point did you realize that Mount yeah. Batten himself had been killed? I think when, when we actually took him from the boat that he'd been brought ashore in and uh, brought him to the ambulance, that's the first that I realized that he had actually being one of the fatalities. He, he was one of the first sexually taken ashore. It was a perfectly ordinary day, that August bank holiday. I was helping to put together the lunchtime bulletin for Radio Ulster. Nicholas Witchell was a trainee reporter at the time in the BBC newsroom in Belfast. We uh, received a tip-off from somebody we knew, suggesting that there had been an explosion reported at Mullock Moor in the Republic of Ireland. I do remember forming the words on my pad, Mountbatten, dead. By now, all but one of the bodies of the boat party had been recovered. Lord Mountbatten and Paul Maxwell had been killed instantly. The 83-year-old dowager fatally injured. The parents of the twins were also seriously wounded, as was 14-year-old Timothy. His twin brother, Nicholas, was still missing. You could see this beautiful blue azure sea just off to the north end of the little peninsula, which Mullabar is. We could see a lot of debris splinters of wood. It was fine debris, quite fine debris it was. 
I was winched from the rescue helicopter. I was placed into the water beside what looked like the bubble of an anorak. I placed my hand and pulled it, and it didn't yield very easily, and I pulled it a second time. And it was then the head come up with the jacket as I pulled, and I realised it was a child. Imagine what those thick Aran sweaters must have felt like clogged with oil and water being lifted out of the, out of the ocean. And, you know, how long had Nick been floating in the water, you know? It was the first child that I handled in death. It came as a, a terrible shock to me, I can tell you, but I'm in rescue mode. I need to get him out of that water. I need to give him over to his family. 14-year-old Nicholas Natchbull's body was returned to Mullochmoor Harbour. It's the last photograph we have of Paul. That's Paul. And that is Nicky and Timmy. So one boy survived and the other two were killed. He survived because he was up on the roof. Mountbatten was in the middle between Paul and Nicky. And so they got the full blast. Later that afternoon, I had a phone call from a contact I knew within the Republican movement, who asked, most unusually, to drive up to the Falls Road to meet him. Opened the door, he got into the car, sat down beside me, we drove on. Then he reached into his mouth, like that, and drew out a small scrap of paper which was wrapped up in cling film, unwrapped it, and this was the a telex message which contained the IRA claim of responsibility for, as they put it, the execution of Lord Mountbatten. The choice of the word execution is very deliberate. It is an attempt to imply that there was some kind of a justification. Execution uh, implies a judicial process, clearly, you know, absolutely inappropriate. By killing Mountbatten, you sent ripples around the world in a way which probably no other assassination could have achieved. While people were still reeling from the news that a member of the royal family had been killed at Moloch Moor, the IRA's operations that day were not yet over. Now the British Army was in their sights. Later that afternoon, over a hundred miles away, Members from another South Armagh unit were lying in wait by the Newry River on the southern side of the Irish border. They were hoping to blow up a British Army convoy travelling along the road from Warren Point across the river in Northern Ireland by detonating two radio-controlled bombs that they'd planted earlier. One, a 700-pound device hidden in a lorry piled high with straw, was parked in a lay-by. The other, a thousand pounds worth of explosive hidden in a nearby gate lodge. Traveling down, I remember messing about with a car behind us. Tom Cochy was a local boy from Newtonards who had joined the parachute regiment at 18, as his father had before him. That day, he was a passenger in the lead vehicle of the two truck convoy. We had a packed lunch and we had oranges and we made little teeth out of the orange, you know, and there was a, a car with a lady and kids in it. And we were smiling at them, you know, that type of banter. Ten minutes later, we were blown up. Not a bang, just a rumble. And I had the sensation of flying. Coming... Not, not even coming to, just looking about, sitting there, and everything's just a mess. I came into the roundabout, 
and you couldn't see past the roundabout, totally obscured with smoke. Peter Malloy was a freelance photographer at the time, who just happened to be passing. I got out, grabbed the cameras, and just as I'm going into it, a policeman's coming running out, and he's screaming. He says, you know, don't go in there, they're all dead. I just put the camera into autofocus, and I just shot generally. The first thing I saw was a long wheelbase jeep, and there were soldiers in that, and one look told you they were, they were obviously dead. And the heat, you couldn't really go too close to it. Everything was burning. And my legs were on fire. No, I couldn't move. And the next thing, the guys were on me. They were pouring water, you know, trying, trying to put me out. And one of the guys uh, gave me his red, red berry to put over my face to keep it, the sun off it. And I can remember lying there and voices. Dead, he's dead, he's dead, he's dead, he's dead, he's dead. And voices getting closer to me. And whether I imagined this or whatever, I don't know, but it, I feel we remembered. I remember saying, I'm not dead. You know, and taking the berry off, you know. It was like a roll call of the dead. Seven of the nine paras traveling in the first truck had been killed. Tom Cochie, along with his friend Paul Burns, were the only survivors. But the carnage didn't end there. A very fine English voice shouted, there could be a second bomb, take hard cover. And they all went over towards the gate. Lodge. Across the river, the IRA bombers were lying in wait, ready to detonate the second bomb. They'd predicted correctly where the surviving British troops were likely to regroup. I remember getting put in that chopper and Paul Burns being put in. I remember looking at his face and it was like something out of Tom and Jerry. When the cigar goes off in your mouth and your face is black and with all little he was like a straw man, you know, bits of straw stuck on his face. And then, boof, bang, it goes again. Boom. I was thrown back and I got up again and it was over. Basically, it was over. The 27th of August had started badly for Mike Jackson. The news came through of the Markmore bombing and the death of Earl Mountbatten, amongst others, which was obviously very shocking. Now, as the news broke that his fellow Paras had been ambushed at Warren Point, Jackson himself was called into action. The brigade commander looked at me and said, Mike, what are you doing here? You go down to the site, secure it, and take on all the aftermath. And so I gave out some rapid orders um, and, and got on the first light helicopter I could. There's no communication. All telephones are cut off, so you're waiting for word to come back from your own, from your own lads to what actually is going on. Is there a bit of you thinking, that's my mates? Yes, absolutely. And you want to know who it was because you know that some of your mates were being killed, were killed. So yes, you did want to know. Dead, 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 dead. A further 11 British soldiers had been killed in the second explosion. I get to Warren Point, and um, it's a pretty grim sight, as you can imagine. There were body parts um, pretty much everywhere. 
and the trees blur everywhere. Um, and uh, those who had survived um, were in shock. It was absolutely obvious right from the earliest point that this was a death toll on an exceptional scale. It transpired, of course, that 18 soldiers had lost their lives, the greatest single loss of life that the British Army had uh, suffered in Northern Ireland. Theirs were not the only lives lost that afternoon at Warren Point. Barry Hudson had been getting ready to go to work at the family's funfair business in Omeath, on the southern side of the border. He had been joined that summer by his 29-year-old cousin from England, Bill. All of a sudden, we heard this thump, right? And um, I remember Bill saying, oh, what, what was that? And I said, sounded like a bomb. He said to me, could you bring me down? Let me have a look. In the mayhem following the two bomb blasts, the surviving paras spotted the figures of Barry and his cousin Bill on the other side of the river and wrongly imagined them to be the IRA bombers. I see the lorry burning, one with the hay on it. For a time, you could see the soldiers coming in along the road there, in the jeeps. You could see the red berries and that, you know. And I heard the ground being struck. And then I felt my arm like a stone hitting it. I thought it was something of stone, maybe, or whatever. And it was bleeding. And then there was more. So. I turned and Bill was standing over there. The car was just parked up there and he was standing to the right, we'll say. And uh, I shouted at him then to get down. And then you could hear more guns and branches cracking and that. So I ran, ran like hell. <clears throat> and zigzagged up that lane. I've seen it in war film. I always thought it was a load of baloney really because uh, you couldn't escape that but I did then it all stopped dead quiet so after about a minute or two I thought my cousin should be coming up now I, I just thought he'd get up and come back up I looked around the corner and um, i seen him lying on his back and uh, blood, a lot of blood. And um, I, uh, I ran down to the car. I knew when I seen him, it's nothing, nothing anyone can do for him. The lad pulled the trigger, I'm sure he was shell-shocked, wasn't, didn't enter his head for one instant, you know, not to pull that trigger. And uh, I think that we would all have done the exact same thing in that situation. It was left to Barry to report the tragic news to Bill's father. Ironically, Bill Sr. worked in Buckingham Palace as one of the Queen's coachmen. I said, oh, terrible news, Uncle. I said, Bill's dead. Oh, dead? Huh? What happened? How's he dead? And I said, he got shot. I said, how did he get shot? Terrible. Terrible. Just one of the worst moments of my life, actually. Something I wouldn't want anyone to have to do. The army later acknowledged that Bill Hudson was an innocent civilian, mistakenly killed.
This multiple killing, the worst the security forces have ever suffered in Northern Ireland, coming as it does after the Mountbatten tragedy, must serve to only further heighten tensions in Northern Ireland. Word quickly spread of how meticulously planned the IRA operation at Warren Point had been. Anthony McIntyre was an IRA volunteer locked up at the Mays prison at the time. I thought it was impressive. I thought it was ingenious because not only did they detonate the first device, they had to wait until the British Army backup arrived and positioned itself behind the gate post and then detonated the, the second one. So it took nerves to stay for the volunteers to sit there and do that. It was absolutely militarily fantastic. Brilliant. I don't want to say the word fantastic, but, you know. But the big bonus that they had that they didn't normally have was they were in a different country. They had no need to run away. Yeah. They, were in, the they were in the south. And that's why they could take their time. You take advantage when you can, and, and they did. Will you please stand still, and I will move. The attacks on Lord Mountbatten and the British soldiers made a deep impression on Mrs. Thatcher who had been prime minister for only four months. Within 36 hours, she landed in Northern Ireland on an unscheduled visit to investigate what had happened and to offer reassurance. When she went to Northern Ireland, I remember the walkabout in the shopping mall, um, which I thought was an extremely brave thing to do. Not because there was much risk of being shot in that environment, but simply because there would be a lot of people in the shopping mall who didn't like it very much. She was a very feminine person. And it's like the just Yes, basically. She was profoundly moved. She didn't blub, but tears came to her eyes. Well, it could have been a lot worse. She only very rarely wept, um, to my knowledge anyway. Um, and when she did, uh, there was good reason for it. She's not everybody's cup of tea, I know that. But she was able to relate, and they to her, to the soldiers. Bodicea, very doughty lady. I think in terms of significance for Margaret Thatcher, knowing as we do what we do about her personality, I'm sure that it actually made her even more determined to resist. Mrs. Thatcher's flying visit did not extend to the scene of the Mountbatten bombing over the border in the Republic of Ireland. Here too, the events of that day it made a huge impact. While it was recognized that the IRA had pulled off two audacious military operations, in PR terms, opinion was divided. Almost everybody spoke with regret and shame about what had happened to Mountbatten. And that sense, this is our territory, how dare they do this on our territory. But there were a number of people, I won't say a majority, but there were a number of people who said what happened to Mountbatten was wrong. But as far as the British soldiers are concerned, listen, those that live by the sword die by the sword. This feeling was reinforced by the fact that 16 of the 18 British soldiers killed at Warren Point were from the paratroop regiment. The Paras were deeply unpopular on both sides of the Irish border, thanks to an infamous incident that had taken place seven years earlier. There is no other single incident in Northern Ireland that unites nationalists of all colour, North and South, like Bloody Sunday does. Because to us, it was the deliberate killing of peaceful protesters on a march in Derry. 13 civil rights protesters were killed in what came to be known as Bloody Sunday. 
Here was the British Army turning its guns on the people it called its own citizens. And the soldiers responsible for Bloody Sunday were the pirate troopers. So there was a particular feeling of, of general dislike towards the paratroopers. This dislike was felt particularly strongly by the IRA volunteers locked up in the Maze prison at the time. And how would you characterise the reaction of you and your fellow prisoners to hearing about the Warren Point news? Exuberance, acceleration. Uh, all our Christmases had come at once and come early. The IRA couldn't believe their luck. For the nationalist population, we were monsters. We were quite ruthless, quite, quite callous, quite indifferent to the suffering of, of the relatives and found the Parachute Regiment absolutely anathema. They were celebrating and of course they were. And, you know, they had a good day. And doubly good in the sense, you know, with the memory of, for them, the memory of... Bloody, of Bloody Sunday. Sunday. Yeah, of course, yeah. yeah that's where the old saying came out, you know. 13 dead, not forgotten. We got 18 on my baton. There's a quote for you. Very good. was extraordinary and I think my grandfather had masterminded every moment of it uh, understandably and it and it and it ran to perfection the whole family of Europe seems to be here Lord Mountbatten's state funeral the largest of its kind since Winston Churchill's provided a vivid reminder of the personal nature of the blow dealt to the royal family We know my grandfather's murder was a complete shock and very devastating to the Prince of Wales because he fulfilled a role and that role was then taken away. So I think he probably felt that more than most, the loss of my grandfather's murder and in such a brutal way. The murder horrified him and in a way marked him for life. It left a sort of a sense of uncertainty. If Manbatten, the, the invincible, the almighty, could be snuffed out like that, then what was left certain in life? Within a week of the funeral, 11-year-old India found herself sent off to Gordonston, the boarding school in the north of Scotland. Here she was given a painful reminder of the very public nature of her grandfather's death. I remember feeling desperately lonely going off to boarding school without my mother. And the first night, someone after lights out saying a joke. And maybe we can't even put this in because it's too, too horrific. But she said, how did they know Lord Mountbatten had dandruff? And no one in the dorm at the lights out knew the answer. And the answer was, of course, because they found his head and shoulders on the beach. Um, it was a pretty staggering moment. Later that autumn, two IRA men were put on trial for the murder of Lord Mountbatten. One, Thomas McMahon, was convicted. Thomas McMahon, did you know him by reputation? Uh, I knew him both by reputation and uh, personally, and he was a very, very fine IRA volunteer. Very fine indeed. Okay, they be the most outstanding figure to come out of South Alabama. Thomas McMahon was sentenced to life in prison, but no one higher up in the IRA leadership chain was ever held to account for the bomb. Somebody knew children get on a bomb. 
not necessarily the guys who put the bomb on or the guys who made the bomb, but the people who planned it certainly knew about the children. And if they knew about the children and were quite prepared to go ahead uh, and to sacrifice their lives in order to get Mountbatten, then it's a war crime. Although Anthony McIntyre has since fallen out with the IRA, back in 1979, he was still very much an insider. They'd given the political sensitivity around Mountbatten and the fallout that the IRA leadership, the political thinking people in the IRA leadership would have anticipated. I would imagine that was a, uh, a, a decision taken at the most senior levels. Here in Conway, who temporarily left the IRA in 1976, is in no doubt as to who was in charge at the time of Mountbatten's assassination. I've absolutely no difficulty in saying that in 81 when I rejoined, and I wouldn't have said that until Martin died, uh, that McGuinness was chief of staff. And your clear understanding was that he had been since 78? Yeah. Ultimately, as chief of staff, it would be McGuinness's responsibility, that operation. Yeah, that's right, too. Yeah. Oh, that's the way it works. I mean, if you're the boss, you're the boss. You take responsibility for whatever goes on. Meanwhile, no one was ever put on trial for the bombs at Warren Point, let alone convicted, despite the arrest on the day itself of two IRA suspects near the scene of the carnage. Well, of course, it's frustrating. The offence is one of murder mass murder, and um, it is a source of great regret that nobody was brought to account for it. In these past few days, the irresistible force, the political will, has met the immovable object, the legacy of the past, and it has actually moved it. It took another 20 years after the Mountbatten and Warren Point killings, but peace was finally established in Northern Ireland by the British and Irish governments at the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. This agreement is good for the people of Ireland, North and South. As part of the peace process, the IRA's prisoners were released, including Thomas McMahon, the sole IRA member convicted of the killings. The idea of reconciliation has lain at the heart of the peace process. And there we get a first glimpse of the Queen. In 2012, the Queen came face to face with the man said to have been ultimately responsible for the assassination of her second cousin. You really did have to just pinch yourself and think can this actually be happening, that the head of state of the United Kingdom and the man who, without doubt, was one of the leaders of the military, the offensive side of the Republican movement, who may well have had a hand in planning Mullet Moore or, or certainly signing off on it, that they were standing together was remarkable. The symbolic strength of that shaking of hands was enormous. Uh, it was one of the most powerful things she could do. And she did it even though personally it may have cost her something. But it was terribly important that that was done. Only she could do it, and she did it. She's a more admirable person in the transaction, I think, you know. Um, I think it was uh, more difficult for her uh, than for him. Like mother, like son, Three years later, the Prince of Wales made his own gesture of reconciliation. The events of 1979 had come as a double blow to him. He was Colonel-in-Chief of the Parachute Regiment, which had lost 16 of the 18 soldiers killed at Warren Point. And at Monarch Moor, he'd also lost the mentor who meant so much to him. At the time, I could not imagine how we would come to terms with the anguish of such a deep loss, since for me, Lord Mountbatten represented the grandfather I never had.
The poet Yeats once wrote, and I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow. As a grandfather now myself, I pray that his words can apply to all those who have been so hurt and scarred by the troubles of the past. Problem with peace is you have to keep working at it. It's not a passive thing. It is always going to be a continuing responsibility on all of us in these islands to make sure that the conditions in Northern Ireland do not encourage the breakout again of sectarian tensions. We do not want to go back to that. So it's not a matter of peace coming, dropping slow. Peace has to be worked at damn hard. Two years ago, Martin McGuinness, the man widely believed to have been the IRA chief of staff at the time of the bombings, died. According to Buckingham Palace, the Queen sent a private letter of condolence to his widow. Today, for the most part, normal life has returned on both sides of the Irish border. But the sense of shame in the village of Moloch Moor lives on, especially among those who'd had close ties to the Mount Battens. There was a terrible sense of shock in this village and disbelief. And there was a dark cloud over the area, over the village for years after. People didn't talk about it. They did in their own houses, hushed, talked and about it, but not out in the open. People felt so bad about what had happened and embarrassed about it. As with the town, so with the individuals themselves. They too are still struggling to come to terms with the tragic events of 40 years ago. I never took another picture since. That's 40 years ago. Why did you never take another photograph? I... I just couldn't face it. I was literally shaken. I watched the firemen and I thought that's what I should have been doing. And the following week, I applied and I joined the fire service then. Uh, loved it. Loved it. I see that young boy's face over and over, and it doesn't go away and it doesn't get any more blurred as it did from 1979 to today, because I can still see it. I'm okay with all that because I brought that kid home. That's 40 years ago now. Yeah. Tell me one day, I'm sure, that it hasn't crossed my mind sometime. That's a long time for something to stick in your mind. Didn't feel lucky at the time. Didn't feel lucky for 10 years after. I wanted to be with them. Why did I survive? It was like a day that would never end. And then it went on to weeks of never end and years where grieving would never end. And it hasn't. I will always grieve for Paul. I carry him in my heart everywhere I go. I asked my mother about doing this and, and she said, yes, absolutely, it's important to keep talking. I think in trauma, and in death and in survival, there is so much that is unsaid and there is unfortunately um, no path. There's no written textbook of healing. And so in amongst my seven cousins who I am and remain close to and my own siblings, everybody coped very differently. And some didn't cope well. And of course we're seeing the side effects of that even to this day, and, and the damage 
that was done was so much deeper than any of us could ever have imagined. And adult lives are still being horrifically disrupted. I certainly try not to hold resentment in any way, and that's hard. But, but forgiveness, I think, is important. One has to move on. The investiture itself was the culmination of a number of events. They were all, from our point of view, deliberately offensive. It will be an occasion for monarchy and state to walk together in harmony, as they have done for so many years now. They were throwing gauntlets down. And someone had to pick them up. When you came to Wales, of course, there was quite a lot of strong anti-English nationalist feeling. Is it something that you come to understand, come to comprehend since you've been in Wales? You see, I think they feel so strongly about Wales as a nation, and, and it means something to them, and they're, they're depressed by, you know, what, what might happen to it if they don't try and preserve the language and the culture, which is very unique and special to Wales. And if something is unique and special, I see it's well worth preserving. Well, it's now just 10 minutes to midnight time on BBC One for us to wish you a very good night. Good night. Yn ystod y nos neithiwr fe ddigwyddodd yr hyn roedd ni i gyd wedi bod yn ei ofni er smisoedd. I believe that the nationalists of Wales have created a monster they cannot control. They have created an atmosphere in which Violence of this sort is seen as the logical end of their philosophy. We in Wales were the local arm, as it were, of a worldwide movement. A worldwide movement, a protest against the, the old established orders of the imperial order, which had led to two world wars and so on. Young people saying that they wanted a better future for their countries. We want a new order which puts people and their cultures first. So the irony of the investiture is that it happens at the end of the 1960s, the end of a decade of extraordinarily tumultuous politics, decolonization, student revolution, the pill, the expectation of equality. It's absolutely huge. Everybody has changed, and this family wasn't. In their island, what they do is reinstate this antique ceremony purporting to be about 600 years old, except they've made it up. The 
promise of the investiture ceremony had been made in Cardiff over a decade earlier. The British Empire and Commonwealth Games in the capital have made this a memorable year for the Principality. I intend to create my son Charles, Prince of Wales, today. When he is grown up, I will present him to you at Carnarvon. I remember sitting in the, in the headmaster's study at uh, Cheam, and uh, th th we were all watching the television, and there were several other boys there, even little ones. I remember being acutely embarrassed when, when it was announced, you know, and I had this marvelous great cheer coming from the stadium in Cardiff. And uh, I think for a little boy of nine, it was rather bewildering. Charles is a frightened, subdued soul. The Queen tells him, across a public address system, for goodness sake, that he's going to be anointed the Prince of Wales. This is a very odd way of being a family, but it's a guarantee of the duty of the sons. This is the way that the royal family was really operating at this point. You are told something, you put up with it, you deal with it, and you cope with it. And it's really hard for Prince Charles because he's a very sensitive child, he's a very thoughtful child, and this weighs heavily on him. He really is expected to just accept it and, and get on with it. The idea of the 1969 investiture was popular in Wales. A Western Mail poll at the time suggested that the majority of Welsh people welcomed their new prince with enthusiasm, without ever questioning his historical right to that title. Wales has always been regarded as something of a poodle. And I think the principle was that we had to show that this was not uh, a sentiment shared by everyone and that there were some people who remembered a bit further back. One of those who questioned the legitimacy of this unfolding ceremonial was a man who had pledged his life to serve Queen and Country, a young army sergeant called John Jenkins, who single-handedly took it upon himself to reorganise and mobilise an underground movement called MAC, Midyad Amdiff in Cymru, against the most public display of state power this small country had seen in recent years. John Jenkins was born in 1933 and raised in Treharis and then Penabryn in the Rumney Valley. He was the son of a miner and he described his childhood as idyllic. The young John wasn't raised as a Welsh speaker, but he was fascinated by history and his Celtic roots. In particular, he was captivated by Capel Gladys, an ancient site on Gelli Gael Common, close to his home in Penabryn. It's a place he would return to many times in his life. He played drums in the local kazoo band, and his love of the drums and the outdoors would take him into the army. He joined the Dental Corps in 1951, and he was to be in and out of the army for the next 20 years. Cyprus, in keeping with British anxiety that the frequent riots may lead to bloodshed, our troops have exchanged their arms for riot sticks and shields. By the summer of 1958, John Jenkins is posted to Cyprus. What well, going on in Cyprus at that time is the Aorca campaign, which is against um, British rule on the island. After four years of an insurgency in which police bases and military bases are targeted, Cyprus is, is handed back its independence, and John realises that this has been achieved with only a, a handful, a comparatively small number of men. British Empire flourishes because of the coal fields in South Wales, because of the, the iron, the steel, not just in South Wales, not just from the slate from North Wales, but it's an integral part of the imperial story. But by the 60s, that empire is, is dead, essentially. The empire is crumbling. Those opportunities that were there in the empire are no longer there. 
the coal fields are beginning to fail so that you see unemployment uh, amongst the coal miners increase in the 1960s. With Welsh industry in slow decline, water was perhaps the only natural resource that Wales had left in abundance. Dams had been built and valleys drowned since Victorian times. But it was the proposal by Liverpool Corporation to create yet another reservoir at Capel Kellyn that was to bring the Welsh nationalist spirit to life. For many in Wales, the drowning of the village of Capel Kellyn in the Trewerin Valley was the defining political event of their generation. Despite protests on the streets of Liverpool, numerous petitions and a vote by every Welsh MP against the proposed scheme, the drowning of the valley went ahead. John Jenkins' political flowering really begins with witnessing what is happening with the flooding of Trewerin. I mean, he's in Germany at the time. He sees that there are 36 Welsh MPs, not one of whom votes in support of the bill, and yet, having exercised this democratic opposition, the voice of Wales is ignored. But he thinks something's wrong here when a nation such as Wales can be hit over the head so badly. Then where do we go from here? Where does that leave us? For some people it said, there is no political democratic solution to this. And the only way we can win our freedom, the only way we can look after Welsh interests is not through the ballot box, but through some kind of violence. And Trewerin does see the emergence of violence as a political tool um, within Wales. The following year, on his return to Wales, John Jenkins was to bear witness to one of the most horrific man-made disasters of the industrial age, in a town that was close to his heart. BBC One continues now earlier than published with 24 hours. I don't know how to begin. Never in my life have I ever seen anything like this. I hope that I shall never ever see anything like it again. This is one of many valleys in South Wales, in the South Wales coalfield tonight. It's a very special valley. It's a valley that contains death. 116 children and 28 adults were killed when the slurry from a coal tip engulfed the local junior school. I began to feel discredited in many ways in that I was a member of, of, a, of a nation which was downtrodden and which was suffering. It was my mother's home, you see, for a start, and uh, I felt it very deeply. It was a combination of various factors which did include Trewerin and did include Abervan. Those were the things which, which made me realise that something must be done. That summer had seen a significant victory for the nationalist movement in Wales, with Plaid Cymru, the Welsh Nationalist Party, winning its first parliamentary by-election in Carmarthen in July 1966, making Gwynfor Evans the first ever Welsh Nationalist MP at Westminster. When we look at independence movements, they're always an amalgamation of different interest groups. A campaign for national independence or national self-determination that is successful is a campaign that is able to bring together all sorts of different perspectives. We see that to an extent in Wales in the 1960s. The success of Plaid Cymru, for example, demonstrates that increasingly more and more people are willing to detach themselves from the two major political parties in Wales. But Gwynvor Evans would struggle to reconcile his position as Plaid Cymru's only representative in Parliament with the demands of other groups within the growing movement for Welsh independence. 
And this is where the ICE was founded in 1962 to try and get official status for the Welsh language, to get road signs in Welsh, um, official forms in Welsh, was part of the awakening of realising that our language was not something which was dying out, but was part of a, a living, new, young enthusiasm for Wales, a, a young revolution in, in Wales. You have Cymdeithas Yr Iaith that are, that are committed to direct action, but Cymdeithas Yr Iaith are also an organisation which is committed to pacifist means. And then you have groups like MAC and the FWA who are committed to a more violent campaign of disobedience, of disruption, of terrorism, if one likes. At Machantleth, young people met to express through a protest march their dissatisfaction with the situation in Wales. These rallies drew together a variety of organisations, the Free Wales Army, the Young Patriots League, the Patriotic Front, the Anti-Sice League, and it's open to question how far these various groups enjoyed shared objectives and shared membership. Well, the FWA started as, uh, you know, two or three people got together, people like K.O. and Dennis Coslett especially, a couple of farmers that were related to K.O., OK, you had a privileged boyhood and uh, education. Uh, you know, public, you went to two or three public schools, I think. <laughs> Expelled from two or three of them as well. Oh, I spent a lot of time at, at uh, Chaos Home. It was a small mansion, it was a lovely, lovely place. He was a throwback, you know, from the days of the princes. That's when he should have been alive, in fact. The days of Glyndwr and Llewellyn. He'd have loved it. There were many non-well speakers in the FWA, uh, especially those from Ronda, Martha, places like that. And they joined the FWA, I think, because they didn't feel as if they fitted in with Pai Company because of the language. They wrongly thought that he had to speak Welsh. And the FWA became a natural home for many of these disenchanted Bali's people. We'll make a stand and prove to the world for once and for all that we are a nation, that we will stand on our feet. At least we have made the dismal pages of Welsh history a little more exciting. Kayo is in the uh, South Wales borders and he fought in Malaya against the communist insurgents, and he always hated communism from then on, and anything left-wing. It was a strange concoction, you know, Republican on one side and a rampant right-winger on the other. <laughs> Destroy the flag of tyranny. That's it. What he, Kayo, is able to see in Malaysia is similar to what John Jenkins is able to see later on in, in Cyprus, which is that he sees these small groups of individuals cause disproportionately large political and social effects through the use of violence. But they also find that these groups are very elusive. Kayo in particular finds that um, in Malaysia the guerrillas can just disappear. And that, of course, is very similar to the way the Welsh have waged warfare for centuries back in medieval times. The landscape of Wales is very rugged, is very rural. And if you look at the ways, the campaigning of, for example, Owen Glyndwr, there's a big emphasis on small, what we might now call guerrilla tactics. Clywedog Dam, a huge construction which is being built near Llanidloes, was to become the target of the more extreme Welsh nationalists. In 1966, it was nearing its completion when the police received a warning that a bomb had been planted on the site. Eight pounds of gelignite had been placed under an 80-foot steel mast that was connected to another by 110 feet of three-inch cable. It exploded, sending the entire construction cascading down the hillside. Speculation was rife about who might have been responsible, but an olive green Castro cap 
found 30 feet from the scene, seemed to point the finger conclusively towards Kayo Evans and his men. I don't think it has been worn by anybody who undertook the operation. It was dropped deliberately by somebody, put it that way. Two hundred people were questioned throughout Wales, one of whom was Gwynfor Evans. So in the dark are they, I think, as to who might be responsible, whatever their suspicions. The Cloedog explosion had in fact marked the return of a shadowy organisation which had been started back in 1962 in reaction to Truerin. This was MAC, Midyad Amdiffin Cymru, the Movement for the Defence of Wales. Most members of then Mark were well known by everyone, including the authorities. So therefore, any action that had to be undertaken had to be undertaken by someone who wasn't known, and I certainly wasn't known. On his return from Germany in 1966, John Jenkins started to reorganise Mac. He was based at Wrexham, at the dental unit in Satan Barracks. As a non-combatant in the army, he had the perfect cover. He was a low security risk, and his job required him to travel around the country. Plus, his role in training the TA band brought him into contact with a new source of potential recruits. Some people would come up and say, oh, so-and-so is a good lad, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's really raring to go. And if he then proved beyond any doubt that he was the right sort of material, he would be recruited and he would then recruit his own cell. One or two people at the most, no more. You know your immediate two or three people in the cell, and you may know the one superior person above that, but you don't know anybody else. They wouldn't even know how to contact me. I would contact the leader of that cell. He was the only one who knew my face. He didn't know who I was, didn't know where I was from, nothing. I would suddenly appear, because I would know where he was all the time. One of John Jenkins' first recruits was to be a 19-year-old flautist in the TA band called Frederick Ernest Alders. It was to be Alders who would drive John Jenkins to a small village in mid-Wales called Llanrhea de Ramochnant to plant his first bomb as Mac's new leader. Most of the villagers who heard the loud explosion thought it was thunder. The explosion caused this gash about seven feet across. Every pipe carries 12 million gallons of water a day to Liverpool. Detectives found a piece of fuse, a small lead plate, a spring, and a brass cover which could have been part of a timing device. They did not find, as reported in some newspapers, any Free Wales Army caps there at all. While the Mac bombers were creating havoc for the authorities, the Labour Party was waking up to the threat of mainstream nationalist politics. The rapturous, adoring supporters of the first Welsh nationalist ever elected to Westminster. Is Gwynfor Evans' triumph merely a quirk of history, or is he the standard bearer of a new Welsh rebellion? The Labour Party in Wales, yes, they were surprised, but it wasn't something that overshook them because in the Welsh heartland, in West Wales, containable. But then a year later, when Ron the West almost went to Plaid, you know, that was really serious business because now Plaid Cymru had come to the door, to the front door, of the Welsh Labour heartland. Somehow, whoever it was, they must have thought back, they must have known their Welsh history, how the investiture of 1911 that Lloyd George himself thought of, how popular that appeared and came across Wales. Someone must have thought, hey, this is what we need to do. For the Labour Party, reviving the investiture ceremony now seemed like a timely political move. There was an understanding, I think, on the part of Labour MPs that the royal family was a lot more popular than one might appreciate if one just listened to the nationalist narrative, and that by holding such a, an ostentatious uh, demonstration of royal power uh, and of unionist power in the capital of Welsh nationalism, they would be cocking a snook at any kind of move towards a more nationalistic Wales. When the Labour government announced that the investiture was to take place at Carnarvon on the 1st of July 1969, it provided a new focus for the nationalists in Wales. I do this sunny boy, but can it leave 
Wedi gallu croesawu a brichu y gored, berson sy'n symbol o'n hyniad a lloegw. Ai, da, 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 and with the first meeting to discuss the investiture arrangements to take place in Cardiff in November, all eyes were on the capital city. The Free Will's army, of course, took up the cause, and in their own unique style, were using every opportunity to draw attention to themselves. With Dennis Coslett, Cayo's loyal lieutenant, getting interviewed on national television by David Frost. Tell me a little about the Free Will's army. What does it stand for? Well, we are a militant group. We are not pacifists, uh, we are neither conscious. We are prepared to fight for our freedom. Fight for your freedom uh, yes. against whom? From, from the imperialist government. The, the, the Free Wales Army did have its role to play within the militant arena. They were visual, they were vocal, and they did succeed in, in diverting resources and attention from the real bombers. What sort of things have you done so far? Well, we've caused a lot of... Uh, damage to your pipelines. How have you done that? How have we done it? Mm. Well, we've just put plastic on, your, on the establishment's pipelines and blasted away. The, the FWA did Mac uh, a great favour. They took all the publicity while Mac uh, could act uh, surreptitiously. Nobody knew who they were, where they were from, where they'd strike next. On November the 17th, 1967, the Investiture's organising committee was to meet at the Temple of Peace in Cardiff. John Jenkins, as Mac's new leader, was acutely aware of the opportunity this presented. John decides that every time a member of the royal family or those involved in the organisation of the ceremony steps into Wales, there will be an explosion. In the early hours of the morning, on the day of the Investiture meeting, a 15-pound bomb exploded in the Temple of Peace. Roads out of the city were immediately sealed off. And within an hour of the blast, known extremists throughout Wales had been roused from their beds for questioning. A frantic effort was made to prepare the building for the meeting, which was due to take place in the Grand Hall at 11.30 that morning. The Queen had appointed her brother-in-law, Lord Snowden, to coordinate the ceremony. He arrived at Cardiff Central Station to be informed that both he and the conference were the subject of a police maximum security operation. I wish to deplore and condemn the action which took place in the Temple of Peace here in Cardiff in the early hours of this morning. of years across the globe since the start of two years of explosions in Wales. The Snowdonia Country Club becomes the first of many MAC targets leading up to the investiture. The bomb went off in this letterbox fixed to the wall at 20 to 2 this morning. Llewellyn the Great was killed fighting the English. And it's in this shrine of Welsh nationalism that Charles Windsor becomes the 20th Prince of Wales, a castle preparing yet again for a siege. Would you like to go to the investiture and see the prince? No. Why not? In case they hear bombs, eh? I believe that the nationalists of Wales have created a monster 
they cannot control. They... George Thomas became a bit of a caricature uh, of someone who hated uh, the Welsh language, even though they were Welsh, and who gravitated towards an English monarchy. Royalty, the royal family, was very, very, very important to George. Hugely important. Gwynoro Jones, who was an official of the um, Welsh Labour Party before he became an MP, for example, used to visit George uh, at his home. He walked into the lounge, either side of the fireplace, you know, two feet by three feet type of size, both sides, the Queen and Prince Charles. Amazing. Funny thing to keep in your lounge, isn't it? The first appointment of the day for George Thomas MP, Secretary of State for Wales. Breakfast with Mam. Even though the announcement of the investiture was in the days of Clinton Hughes, the carrying out of the process, that was George's responsibility, and I bet you he must have loved it. He really, he would have been in his element. The Prime Minister said to me, and next year, George, you will have the investiture of Prince Charles. Well, at that stage, I didn't think it was going to involve any uh, problems, because I thought, well, that's right, it'll be a very pleasant occasion, but a full stop. But of course, we had a lot of anxieties first. A device had been placed on a basement windowsill and the blast, which was heard three miles away, blew indoors and threw furniture around. No sooner had George Thomas become Secretary of State than Mac struck again, audaciously blowing up his headquarters at the Welsh office. Minister, do you think that, uh, say, Home Rule for Wales would stop this sort of thing? Not at all. A Home Rule for Wales isn't wanted by the Welsh people. You'd start a lot more trouble if you tried to give home rule to Wales. What we are seeking for is a greater sense of participation in the work of the government. Prince Charles, on a visit to the Welsh office, has his first experience of anti-investiture protest. But the throwing of smoke bombs evoked little sympathy for the protesters, who were accused of, in the words of one church leader, ignorant discourtesy to a young man who is in no way responsible for the position in which he finds himself. La 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 well, I was um, I was a student in uh, University College, happiness as he was in, at the time. Prince Charles was to be seconded to Aberystwyth for six weeks of the summer term, during which time he's going to learn the Welsh language, he's going to learn everything about Welsh history and um, Welsh culture, so that he'd be acceptable then as Prince of Wales. It was quite a surprise when I learned that I was going to be sharing lectures with um, the Prince of Wales. I wasn't very excited about that. In fact, I thought it was pretty awful. I thought it was quite ridiculous that he would spend a term and learn all he needed to know. There we go. Not my choice. Uh, but when I was chosen by my fellow students to be the chair of Plaid Cymru in the university, uh, it did become a bit of my business, I have to say, because we became then um, open to persuasion by the authorities to behave ourselves and not to engage in what was called immature protest against the Prince. I received a letter from the principal at Aberystwyth University and there was a, an envelope inside an envelope and this was marked as to be opened only by the Secretary of State for Wales personally. So I opened it. 
and in it he expressed his grave anxiety for the physical security of Prince Charles. I couldn't keep this to myself. I had to report it to the Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, who said to me, what is your advice, Secretary of State? I said, to proceed. They, we cannot have a part of the United Kingdom where a member of the royal family dare not go for safety reasons. We must proceed. The secret police was there at work in the college in Aberystwyth at the time. They had two functions. One was a legitimate function to ensure the personal safety of someone who was the heir to the British throne. But they were also there to ensure that the British state was not politically embarrassed. When uh, we held our protest, the day in which he arrived at the college, I climbed onto the roof of the old college building and I tore up some pieces of paper and I dropped them down as confetti to mark the, the marriage of the University College of Wales with the British establishment that they were willing to sell out to be used for a blatantly political purpose. I was told later on that police marksmen were on four other nearby roofs with their rifles trained at me. So at the time, so had it even seemed that I was dropping anything more sinister than a tiny bit of paper, uh, I'd have been taken out immediately, therefore. Mr. Mildred, as one of the Prince's tutors, you'll be putting the final touches to his timetable today. Just how rigorous a syllabus will it be? It's quite a heavy syllabus. He'll have his plate uh, quite full during these nine weeks, and uh, he's very willing to work hard. It was very strange to be in Edward Millward's company because he was vice chair of Pride Cymru in Aberystwyth and he was a member of staff and he was a tutor who was teaching Prince Charles Welsh and he was one of the people who was most concerned that Pride Cymru, uh, the University of Pride, Pride Cymru responded maturely and sensibly and didn't make fools of ourselves or the prince but he was felt by the students to have sold out to the institutions by um, cooperating so enthusiastically. There have been stories that you've had rather a lonely time at the University of Wales, the Is this so? Well, it is. I wonder where these reports come from, but I suppose they circulate. Um, I, you see, the trouble is that one has to remember that I'm in a slightly different position from several other people. And I think they try and put themselves in my position too much. I think out of certain necessity, I've uh, perhaps been more lonely, if they like it. I mean, I, I haven't made a lot of friends, if, if that's what they mean. and. Uh, I haven't been to a lot of parties or anything. There haven't been very many. And I've had a lot of other things to do. I, I've, I mean, I've been around Wales a lot and looked at things and visited people. And essentially it is, I suppose, compared with other people's lives, more lonely. And in this sense, I suppose I've had a lonely time. He would arrive to the back door of the college in his sports car. Uh, he would be accompanied by several policemen, uh, and two of them would guard his car. Uh, and then he would go in for the university lecture halls. Students would be there already. He would come in, he would sit in the front of the lecture hall, and there would be two policemen outside the door to ensure his safety. also learned the Welsh language. Did you find that very difficult? Because most English tongues find it very difficult to get round. Well, it, I think all languages are difficult, but I suppose there are certain things. I mean, the double L's are, are terrible. Well, they were fairly difficult, except that I went to Llanelli not long ago, and the mayor said, can you say Llanelli? So I said, Llanelli, and he wiped the saliva out of his eye and said, well done. But it's, you know, the, the, the there is a way of doing it. You, know, you put your tongue in a certain place and blow. The speaking Welsh, like, you know, is, um, uh, it's, a, it's a trick and it's worked because he's done a very short course in a language laboratory which has taught him how to pronounce words. And he is always reading, he reads it off the paper. Rydwi wedi sunni at el hoch gystedlaethau an a sefydliad rhagorol yma. Ac rydwi wedi cael blas arbennig. Are a canny brood, a fersine. Canny morvrood. Villa bethain da, a chile chigid, 
yng Nghaerin Arfon. Prince Charles has won over the hearts of uh, most of the middle-aged women, especially. Uh, and this has been effective, you know, and the ceremony itself was cooked up more or less for the 1911 ceremony at Carnarvon uh, by Lloyd George. And uh, it was then a political gimmick, and to a great extent it is now also a political gimmick. Well, this picture is uh, a very splendid picture of the presentation of the very first English Prince of Wales to be presented to the Welsh people in uh, 1284. And this little fellow here is the actual Prince of Wales being held by his dad, King Edward I. And here are the painters of this splendid picture. There's Ian, Lynn and Mark. Hello. Uh -huh. Now, of course, there is the famous story that uh, the Welsh would ref had said they were going to refuse to have any, any Prince of Wales who didn't speak Welsh. And so Edward tricked them and he brought out his newborn son, who spoke no language at all, and said, here is a Prince of Wales who doesn't speak English. That is a complex moment of, of myth-making, really, uh, because actually the investiture of Edward II took place over in Lincoln, uh, in East England, rather than Carnarvonshire, in 1301, 17 years later. And no ceremony was recorded, and certainly nothing happened in Carnarvon, um, because Edward wasn't there. So when we think about these ceremonies, we've got to think about an idea first coined by historian David Canadine, that was the invention of tradition. Uh, the monarchy stress through staging royal ceremonies in more public ways, that this stuff is old, that it has a long tradition reaching back hundreds of years, if not a thousand years, when in fact all of the, the pageantry, the pomp and circumstance, the colour, the gold, the glitz that we associate with the modern British monarchy, a lot of it's come from the 19th century it, as a way of sort of articulating a sense of shared history and heritage that unites the nation as a whole. 1969 is definitely a departure from 1911 in terms of the way the ceremony looks and feels. And instrumental to the changes is the figure of Lord Snowden, Anthony Armstrong Jones, who had, at the start of the decade in 1960, married the Queen's younger sister, Princess Margaret. And in his approach to the ceremony in 69, he tries to incorporate um, all of the sort of the feel of the 1960s, that it is a more modern ceremony. I think that when I did it, there are certain people um, thought I was going to be a whiz kid and um, do an ultra-modern thing. Actually, it was very traditional. And if... Um, it's sort of like what Henry V would have done if he'd had perspex. I wanted it to be romantic, I wanted it to uh, be good on television, that was the only thing. I did not want it to be an elitist ceremony. In the stage management of a national occasion, there's never been such a bias towards television before. Scarcely a battlement here without its cameras. And under the guiding hand of Lord Snowden, the castle has become a kind of medieval television studio. I mean, it would be madness to design it just for the few inside. I must design it for the 500 million viewers, which is believed to be watching. And the rehearsal started where the procession itself will start, at the special Royal Railway platform built near a factory two miles from the town. It was one of the biggest security uh, the country had ever seen at that time. There were nearly two and a half thousand police officers. They came from everywhere, including the plain clothes. I think there were about a thousand of those, one and a half thousand nearly uniformed officers. To organize such an event was, was enormous. The, the gentleman in charge, the, the uh, Duke of Norfolk, uh, he was an experienced coordinator of, of such events, but the biggest danger is if you pre-tell everybody where you're coming, how you're going to do, where you're going to walk, a good terrorist can either have a sniper, an explosion, or what have you, and that's how, if I was going to attack anybody, how I'd do it. The discovery of a bomb near Holyhead Pier, where the Royal Yacht was due to visit, intensified police fears over security. Three men were arrested, but their connection to Mac was never proved. Hello and good evening from Carnarvon on the eve of the investiture. The town which seems about to explode as the sightseers pour into the streets to... John Jenkins, meanwhile, was hiding in plain sight, right under the noses of the security forces. Still a sergeant in the British Army, he had managed to get himself stationed at a temporary army camp in Carnarvon, from where he was directing his bombers. 
the night before the investor, there were four groups out. And the object of the exercise was to disrupt the ceremony and to cause as much uproar as possible. One was a, a, a bomb placed somewhere near the, where the, where the um, royal family court would be coming down. Not near enough to cause any damage, but near enough to cause uproar. Another was placed in the chief constable's garden, and that was timed to create a 22-gun salute rather than a 21-gun salute. And another one was to blow up a pier at which the royal yacht was due to harbour, which meant it wouldn't be able to harbour because there was no pier there. The fourth device was to be set in Abergele, 35 miles up the coast from Carnarvon, by two MAC operatives, Alwyn Jones and George Taylor. John has insisted that he instructed the cell leader, Alwyn Jones, to target a government installation in the town, a social security office, because Abigail is en route to Carnarvon, and John is, is aware that the Royal Train will be passing through Abigail on its way to Carnarvon. I know people like to say, oh, the Royal Train, because it makes good copy. It was not true. We did not target the Royal Train. There was no intention to hurt or kill anybody. There never was. There was a hole in the, in the ground, uh, not a very deep hole, and there was a pair of shoes uh, alongside the hole where the person had been blown up out of his shoes. Uh, <clears throat> it was dark there and you could not identify anything that you found. Um, I think the, uh, it, we had to wait until daylight really to find the extent of it, but you, we knew that there were two persons. On the day the world's media focused on the investiture, two of John Jenkins' operatives were found to have blown themselves up with a bomb Jenkins himself had made. An officer put his head in and said, well, we got two of the bastards last night. I went down to the sergeant's mess to find out what was happening, and all they had on was bloody cricket or tennis or something. So I had to sit there through all that. So I had to act as if nothing had happened. Then, laugh and drink with them all and joke about it and stuff like that. And it was several hours later I discovered which group it was. As the programme went on air, two unexploded devices still remained in Carnarvon. There's the Prince of Wales. He's got out of the train now and into his carriage, wearing the uniform of the Colonel-in-Chief of the Royal Welsh Regiment. With him is the Secretary of State for Wales. We would be untrue to history if we did not say everyone including the royal party. Everyone held their breath until the thing was over. There was a team of three uh, commentators on Radio Wales, and I was situated on top of the Chamberlain Tower in the castle. Now he moves off into town. We shall pick him up in just a few minutes when he's entering the outskirts of Carnarvon itself. And there, out at Griffith's Crossing, Majesty the Queen. When the Queen arrived in Griffith's Crossing and came off the train, there was to be a 21-gun salute. We had instructions. Whoever was on the air when the royal salute began was to queue back to me, and I would say immediately jump in and say, now you heard that, that, that gun go off. That was, the, that was the first of the 21 gun salute signaling the fact that the Queen has now arrived in Wales and is on her way into Carnarvon. And we got into our commentary scene setting, uh, myself in the castle, John down behind the days, Glyn out and the mice where there were thousands of people.
and suddenly and rather unexpectedly there was this boom and so Glynn, fair play, did exactly as he, we had arranged. He handed back to me and I said, jumped in quickly and said, there you are, he said, you've just heard the first gun of the 21 gun salute. Now we'll listen to the other 20 uh, guns. Absolute silence, nothing. It was quite clearly a bomb, but Prince Charles just looked at me and said, what was that, Mr. Thomas? So I s said, Royal salute, Prince Charles. And he looked at me with a question mark in his eyes and he said, peculiar royal salute. <laughs> and I know North Wales will forgive me because I said, peculiar people up here, sir, I have to say something <laughs> to cover up. And we both laughed. I said, ah, well, evidently that wasn't the first gun of the 21 gun salute. And then I looked over my shoulder and I just saw a plume of smoke on the, on the hill behind the, the other side of the, the harbour and some people running around. And in fact, it had been uh, a bomb, maybe a diversionary bomb, but it was a bomb. Now, what we're looking at now is uh, an incident of some kind. Somebody is... I heard an explosion just a little moment ago. We thought that one of the guns had gone off accidentally. There could just possibly have been an explosion. The bomb, planted by Mac in the Chief Constable's garden on Love Lane, had detonated as planned, throwing the traditional 21-gun salute into disarray. Now, here's the Queen, following up behind her son and just on the outskirts of the town with a full sovereign's escort. The Queen is utterly preternaturally calm. Nothing, nothing can flap her. I mean, the Queen herself was very nervous when she went through the coronation. She was very nervous about the ceremonial, very nervous about the fact that if you put a foot wrong on TV, it'll never be forgotten. So how must Prince Charles feel going into this impossible new ceremony. A young man, he's not king yet, he's a long way from that responsibility, and he's young, and he's nervous, and he takes things incredibly seriously. If he puts a foot wrong, he will really take it terribly to heart and feel he's made a dreadful mistake. Scotland, Prince of Wales, and Earl of Chester, and to the same our most dear son, Charles Philip Arthur George, have given and... So the story goes, whether true or false, that the, the coronet designed by the Garter King of Arms and Louis Osman, that the bauble at the, the centre of the coronet malfunctioned just days before the investiture. And so, rather than fuse the original bauble back at the centre of the coronet, what instead they had was a, was a ping-pong ball wrapped in gold leaf, uh, which made it there on the day. The symbol of sovereignty. I'm not totally convinced by the story. I think it's one that the uh, the tabloid press ran with a few years ago. Am hani ar ewilchisiwn a corhodun o'r chymyn cae ar ein rhan ni. Fe o'r sbrydolwyd pob un o'r bobl hyn. Mae yw'n rhyw ffordd neu gilydd gan y trefthadaeth hon. The one big tension point, of course, was after the actual investiture, when the Queen and the Prince of Wales went up and to the wall of the castle overlooking the mice and uh, were being presented to the people, as it were. But once they appeared on the balcony, everybody was holding their breath. As the newly crowned Prince of Wales proceeded towards his public, one of Mac's bombs remained undetonated in the streets of Carnarvon. We can only guess at what her feelings were in that moment when she presents her boy to the people. 
and they're there, just kind of raw, exposed, beautiful, but very vulnerable space. And she's giving him to risk, exposure, danger. There is no mistaking spontaneous applause, and this is the real thing. At the end of Investiture Day, there are, there are two Mac devices which have yet to activate, which should have activated at some point during the Investiture Day. The first, which John claims was, was placed at Clandidno Pier as a way of preventing Prince Charles from stepping off from the Royal Yachts Britannia onto the pier to begin the Royal Tour of Wales, which apparently is never found. Or is found, but the, the authorities have denied any knowledge of it. But the other device in Carnarvon is then activates on the 5th of July, five days after the investiture, when 10-year-old Ian Cox, who's on holiday from England, goes to retrieve his ball, it's gone, it's gone behind a wall, kicks out at what he thinks is an old lamp stand. It activates and he, he suffers severe burns and his right leg is amputated. The, the, without question, the low point of this campaign is the injuries to that little boy. The perfectly understandable response is that such injuries to a 10-year-old boy can never be justified, whatever the political cause. Whenever anything failed to detonate, a call was always made to the police to tell them about it and where it is. And this was done, but they didn't take any notice of it, apparently. So I made a point of asking when I was captured eventually, uh, why didn't, didn't you take any notice of the call about the, the bomb? And they said, because it was one of thousands we had on that day, and we couldn't possibly investigate all of them. Such a campaign of, of sort of indiscriminate time devices, um, deaths and injuries are p perhaps inevitable one way or another. Explosions on remote pipelines in the Welsh mountains is one thing. Blood on the streets is quite another. This is as, as bad as it gets. I think, looking back, Charles was the experiment. He was the guinea pig, if you like, in the royal family media project, in the whole, let's get the TV cameras in and show ourselves off. Now, partly, that's a pact with the devil. They have to do it, because that's the commandment, really, of modernity. But it puts them at huge risk. He can't go back to being a private royal, a private student, ever again. I think John gets a sense that the police are onto him, and so he returns home and finds himself back at Capel Gladys, which has always been a place of sanctuary for him. John said if the pressure was bad leading up to the investiture, after it, it, it was just almost to the, probably unbearable actually. Having lost two colleagues in Mac, owing to a bomb which he had assembled, which he had handed to the cell leader, Alwyn Jones, but if that wasn't bad enough, then he has the, the injuries to Ian Cox five days later. However successful his campaign of disruption had been, these failures were weighing heavily on him. I think he was just relieved, is the impression I get. He, he said it, it almost came as a relief when I heard that knock on the door. Fifty years on, aged 86, John Jenkins is seeing out his days in a nursing home, having forgotten nothing. While history seems to have forgotten him and the war he once waged against the British state, he says his only regrets are the deaths and the casualties that he caused. The investiture thrust Charles into a life lived under constant media scrutiny and intrusion. Fifty years on, at the age of 70, he remains a monarch in waiting and the longest serving Prince of Wales in British history. Sean Lloyd asks what the Prince of Wales has done in and for Wales in Charles, Prince for Wales, available on BBC iPlayer.
she made. That's an oath, and she's taken it seriously. Well, thank you once again for inviting us in. Thank you. the coming week, as we celebrate the friendship, spirit of unity, and achievements of the Commonwealth, we have an opportunity to reflect on a time like no other. Whilst experiences of the last year have been different across the Commonwealth, stirring examples of courage, commitment, and selfless dedication to duty have been demonstrated in every Commonwealth nation and territory notably by those working on the front line who have been delivering health care and other public services in their communities. We have also taken encouragement from remarkable advances in developing new vaccines and treatments. The testing times experienced by so many have led to a deeper appreciation of the mutual support and spiritual sustenance we enjoy by being connected to others the need to maintain greater physical distance or to live and work largely in isolation has, for many people, 